Well, it looks like we currently have around 55 people here. So a good amount have arrived. I think more, more folks may be trickling in, but I'm, um, I'm inclined to go ahead and get started. Um, so let's go ahead and do so. Do you want to replace the uh, before we start picture with uh, your speaker? So that makes it a little bit more straightforward since people can get it in the chat. By, by the way, I got the files. Sure. Um, let's see, is there a slide for JJ? Or JJ, no, just you want the to one show, up, show your first slide? Yep, I'm going to put it in the chat again. Please have a look in the chat, everyone. Um, there are some WAVE files that JJ has provided for the meeting, and I've put those in the chat. You can click on that, and then you'll download them, unzip them, and it's not they're not big or anything like that. So you can listen to those when it comes time to do so. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and get started. Uh, welcome, everybody. Thanks a lot for joining us. Um, I'm excited to have another meeting um, with JJ Johnston uh, talking about masking tonight. Um, and so um, this has been a longstanding tradition to have JJ talk. Usually we try to have JJ here at least once a year. So I'm really excited to have JJ back and I wanna thank him for being here again. Um, my name's Greg Dixon and I'm the chair of the Pacific Northwest AES section. And again, I am so happy to have you all here. Welcome. I did want to make a few brief announcements about our upcoming meetings. And in addition, I uh, need to make a few technical announcements that I'll make after we talk about uh, our next upcoming meetings. So next month, we have an exciting meeting planned with um, an engineer named Jam Phelps. And that's going to take place on February 9th again at 6 p.m. Um, Seattle time. And the focus for Jam's presentation is gonna be an introduction to Reaper. And um, she's gonna be talking about all different kinds of things going on with Reaper Digital Audio Workstation and helping us understand some of the basic ins and outs along with a focus on automation. So please join us next month, month February 9th 6 p.m. and that's going to be online. Um, so we'll have that Zoom link ready for you if you um, RSVP on our website. And uh, Jam is a mix engineer, music producer, and owner of Dank Studios in Durham, North Carolina. So again, February 9th. Hope to see you there. The following month, Micah Hayes, who is a committee member on the, um, he's on the committee for the Pacific Northwest AES section. He will be giving a presentation about the recording um, program and studios at SPU or Seattle Pacific University. That meeting is going to take place on March 3rd, I believe at 6 p.m. as well. And this is going to be another one of our concurrent meetings. So we are the plan is that the meeting will take place at SPU but we will also be streaming the meeting, the meeting live and also taking feedback and talking with you all on Zoom. So that's March 3rd at Seattle Pacific University with Micah Hayes. Um, in June, uh, we have our annual elections um, and I wanna invite folks that may be interested in participating um, on the committee. Maybe if you're interested in becoming more involved with the Pacific Northwest AES section um, to consider that. And if you're interested in becoming act, more active and more deeply involved with our section, go ahead and send me an email. I'm gonna type my email in the chat real quick. So you can send me an email at gregdixonmusic at gmail.com. And those are our elections coming up in June. Um, finally, I have a few technical detail announcements. First of all, if you can, please use your real name in the, in the Zoom meeting. So if your name is not coming up with your first and last name, 
um, you can either right click if you're on Windows, if you right click on your name, you can um, change it by choosing rename. Um, or if you're having trouble figuring out your name, maybe post something in the chat and someone here will help you. So please use your real name. The other thing is um, how, how you can ask questions while the meeting is going. Oh, actually I should start by saying, wh while JJ is presenting tonight, uh, we'd like to ask that you mute your microphones and also for all of us to mute our video cameras. Uh, this will help the presentation uh, look and sound the most professional way that we can make it. So again, please mute your microphone and mute your cameras while JJ is presenting. If you have questions for JJ, uh, please type them into the chat. And we have a moderator tonight, um, Steve Turnage, who will be helping us out with moderation. And Steve will help relay your questions to JJ when the time is appropriate. So please use the chat for your questions as JJ presents. Um, if for any reason you have your camera on, sometimes what can happen is one of our one of our hosts or moderators will end up muting your camera if you inadvertently have it on and we don't want it to be on. If for any reason we've muted your camera, please don't take any offense. Uh, that's just what happens if it's on. Um, however, if you need to have your camera unmuted, you'll need to have one of our moderators unmute your camera. So if this happens to happens to you and you feel like you can't turn on your camera, please go ahead and send us a message on the chat and we'll do our best to fix things after the presentation concludes. And then lastly, in terms of the format, after we're done, um, we're gonna have a kind of social event where what we like to do is we'll have short breakout rooms where, we're, where we'll throw all the participants into a randomly into a breakout room and you can socialize and meet people. These breakout rooms are gonna be short, just sort of a, a way to say hello and introduce yourself. They'll be short five, five minute meetings and there'll be two of those after JJ, JJ's presentation concludes. Following the breakout rooms, we're gonna extend the session a little bit longer for brief in introductions. So if you'd like to stick around and wanna introduce yourself, get to know some of the other um, people that are here at the meeting, other members of the AES, please feel free to stick around and, and we'd love to learn more about you and where you're at and everything. I think that that's all that I have in terms, uh, terms of announcements for myself. At this point in time, I'm gonna turn the time over to Dan Mortensen to talk a little bit about an initiative that he has going um, that's an online meeting initiative called Tea Time Topics. And then Dan is gonna help me uh, turn the time over to Steve who will be introducing JJ. So without further ado, Dan, uh, tell us about Tea Time Topics. Great, thanks, Greg. Uh, Tea Time Topics is a thing we do every Saturday from uh, 3.30 to roughly 7.30 Seattle time, where we pick a subject and for next week and talk about it. Uh, last week, uh, Gordon uh, McGregor in Scotland told us, uh, showed us about uh, uh, loudspeaker beam steering. And he had examples of a couple of software programs that allow you to do that. Uh, the Martin MLA and the EAW Anya, where the, the, the box stays still, but you can point the uh, pattern up and down and even break it in the middle so that you are covering places that you want to cover and you're not covering some place that you don't want to cover. Uh, and that was real interesting. And that we got into uh, some stories that have happened to us, those of us who do live sound. And uh, uh, we're that's what our next meeting is going to be, is live sound stories uh, about things that went well and things that didn't go well. <laughs> and uh, if you want to come to it, uh, send me a uh, uh, note in the chat. And I, sh I probably have your email address because I'm the one who does the Eventbrite stuff, but go ahead and send me your email anyway. 
Um, and you can uh, private message me by clicking in chat on the everyone and you'll see a list of all the participants and you can send directly. So it's from, uh, it's at three o'clock, uh, 3.30 Seattle time. And we start at three to get everybody's microphone and uh, camera working so that, because it's a real interactive thing, we encourage questions from people and uh, comments. And we have a pretty smart bunch of people and a bunch of you are here now actually too. And uh, it, even when the presenter is an expert on something, someone will come up with something that the presenter didn't know. Uh, and that's always fun too, not, which is not saying that the presenters don't know what they're talking about, but uh, it, it's a fun go around. And after the meeting today, we'll kind of do a modified version of that after the self-introduction since everybody is here already and this is so easy to be in a meeting. Uh, you're in your comfortable chair, I hope, and you've got something nearby to drink and eat. And uh, it, it's fun to talk about audio stuff. And if you have an audio question, something's been stumping you, uh, this is a good place to ask it because there's a bunch of smart people here today too. So that'll be after the breakout rooms and after the self-introductions. And uh, again, let me know if you want to come to the tea time things and uh, I'll tell you more about it if you want in my part later. So uh, I think that's it, Greg, back to you. I'd be back to me actually. Back to Steve. Okay, now introduce Thanks. from his uh, cave in uh, North Seattle, uh, the eminent Steve Turnage, former committee member, uh, former chair maybe? Yep, and vice yep. chair and yeah. also, I'm former everything. Yeah, now I don't currently. I ever stuck you with treasure. Now currently. No, not at all. Now um, currently, please welcome Steve. Well, thank you very much. Now currently, uh, there, and I have to say that the reason I have lights at all is because Dan shamed me into getting lights, so that's all. But we, as a section, yeah, there you go. It worked. Pestering. Uh, we, as a section, are very fortunate to have among our number, Mr. James Johnston, JJ. He came to, uh, to town, I don't know, about 12 plus years ago, and the first meeting 20. we had was about, pardon me? 20. 20 years. Okay. <laughs> the first meeting we had with him, though, was on hearing. And that one day was at the U UW. <clears throat> and that one day, I learned more about hearing than I had knew I didn't know. And so he's been consistently uh, a great educator and friend. And he has a legacy that goes to Bell Labs and the original Codex and working up till now to immersion networks where uh, they're doing magic, which is not really known <clears throat> by the world yet, but uh, it's future legacy. And it's and all of this stuff is remarkable. And I, it's my great pleasure to be able to introduce JJ and also to um, heckle as needed from your questions in the chat. So um, feel free to chat. I will step out and thank you, JJ, go for it. Okay. Um, what caused me to start doing this talk was a bunch of people were saying, if I put two instruments here, but versus here, if whether the level of the instruments will one mask the other one and so on, prompted me to make a more general talk about masking. Um, as you'll find out, it's an annoyingly complicated sort of subject and the answer to a question, at least in most cases, is still going to be try it and see what happens, but we can at least give you some guidance here. So first thing, hello, wake up, thank you, computer. Um, first, there is a previous talk called Hearing 096. It's on the, th on the website. Um, if you find this talk perplexing, you might want to go back and listen to that talk and then come back and listen to this talk again in the recording, and that may help quite a bit. The key here is this last line right here, which is that the ear is a time frequency 
analyzer. Me what that means, it means that it's sort of like Fourier analysis, but only sort of. The um, at low frequencies, the year has more or less a constant bandwidth sort of structure. At high frequencies, it's more like quarter of an octave and it sort of blends from one to the other in the middle. Um, but this will lead to a term called ERB, which some of you may have also heard is critical band. That they're slightly different, but they intend to measure the same thing. And that is actually describing what's happening on one little piece of your cochlea. And that's to, which helps, <coughs> pardon me, it's allergy season. Um, and that, but which helps you um, figure out actually how the ear is going to um, understand and capture anything. What does ERB stand for? Equivalent rectangular bandwidth. You don't you want you don't want me to get into that, but basically you can think of it as if you took all if you took the entire filter and you pushed it into a square, a perfectly square shape, that would be an ERB. Cool. Yeah, I'll be asking you whenever you do TLAs, three letter acronyms or more, to expand them. Thank you. Okay, well, you know, PV equals NRT, right? As desired. That's the, that's the ideal gas law, but that doesn't matter. Uh, in order to basically, what is masking? Well, we need to define loudness accurately. Loudness is a sensory term, it reads the sensory intensity of a signal. And it is not the, the sound pressure level, it is not dB, it is measured in sones or in fawns, both of which are measurements that are expressed in sensory terms. Um, if you go back to the meeting um, archives for the Pacific Northwest, there's a bunch of talks about loudness as well, um, may help you decode some of this. But Part of the thing to remember about loudness is loudness is effectively the sum of a bunch of partial loudnesses. Now, what partial loudness is, is the amount, is the firing rate of neurons at one point on the cochlea, which means they correspond to one frequency band on the cochlea. So partial loudness is a vector or a broadside line of levels basically coming out of the cochlea that express the loudness at different frequencies. And they do express the loudness because it's the neural firings that create the loudness sensation. It's a, it's a function of both time and frequency because the filters in the air vary quite a bit in terms of their uh, overall impulse response. So high frequency filters are fast, low frequency filters are slow but it's a function of the bandwidth of the filter, not the frequency, you have to remember that. So basically at high frequencies, effectively the bandwidth is about a quarter of an octave, at low frequencies it's about 40 Hertz. So when we talk about partial loudness, we're talking about any, we're talking about this vector of things, or if we talk about something in one ERB, we're talking about the loudness, the part of loudness that just results from one on only one ERB. So the ERB is basically the bandwidth of the filter. It basically, it measures the cochlear excitation. Like I said, the inner hair cell in the cochlea is the detector that excites the auditory nerve. It does other things too. And this is where we start getting into masking. The signal to noise ratio of that inner hair cell is about 30 dB, but because of the mechanics and the neurology of the cochlea that gets masked across 80 or 90 dB of actual input level via, via the cochlear mechanics in the outer hair cells. And this 30 dB number is very strongly related to masking issues. The point being is if, this, if the second signal is inside the same ERB, it's con they're both continuous and the second signal is lower is more than 30 dB down, chances are it's below the noise level of the system and you're just not ever gonna hear it. So that is the source, one of the sources of masking and it is the, in many senses, the strongest one. But now what we talk about when we have 
this measurement partial loudness is, is a function of time. The masking happens when the partial loudness and the total loudness do not change when something is added to the signal. In other words, mask means there's a partial loudness of zero. The signal is indetectable to the ear. And like I said, the signal to noise ratio of the inner hair cell is limit. It's the, if you will, the outer, the most, the most generous limit in terms of how sensitive the ear can be. There are other limits and we'll get there in a minute. Now we get to the different files. Um, if you're gonna play these, just compare the one that says NB noise to the second one and then compare it again to the third one. Since probably nobody is actually trying to um, play this during the talk, which makes sense. And what we hear is when the one that's Versus the comparison of the first and the second files, this file versus this file, you're going to hear pretty much no different. And versus, and when you listen to the first file versus the third file, it's going to be obviously different. Now, the difference in these files is only in the frequency of the sine wave that's been masked under a narrow band noise. In the first case, the narrow the sine wave is directly in the middle of the narrowband noise, which is actually one ERB wide. And in the second case, we have the same noise, but the actual sine wave is an octave below that, and it's just utterly obvious. And so that's what you will hear when you listen to these. That is the, dem the first demonstration of masking, which leads to a point, and now I'll show you here, the top one is the narrowband noise spectrum. I know these are really thin and hard to look at, the next one is shows the sine wave on top of the narrow band noise. And the third one shows the sine wave well separated in frequency in place of the narrow band noise. And I, given the, uh, the actual 4K versions of these plots to the AES and uh, to, the, to the section here, and they will put them up so you can look at these in more detail if you want. But the whole point is the first case, the sine wave is smack in the middle of the noise. The second time, it's not. So you heard nothing in the first one. I mean, if you did, it would be extraordinary um, and maybe due to a resonance in a headphone or something. And the second one, well, yeah, everybody can hear that. The masker is the narrow band noise. The sine wave is the same level exactly. I mean, we're talking about to you know double precision accuracy, the same level. The two sine waves have exactly the same level. In one case, you can't hear it. It doesn't exist as far as your is concerned. And the other case is perfectly obvious. So the point is, well, two signals, if you will, identical signal to noise ratio, or in this case, where the noise, so to speak, is actually the sine wave. In one case, the sine wave is completely masked, it's gone. And the other one, it's blatantly obvious. So this creates first rule of masking. Masking is frequency-based. Frequencies near each other inside of an ERB interact. And there's a little bit more to that. Masking will spread upward in frequency a little bit, maybe up to two or three ERBs, not much. Um, it's worthwhile knowing about if you build a codec, it's probably not worthwhile to worry about if you're trying to figure out if I play these two instruments at the same position in the stereo field, will you hear both of them? Probably not worthwhile thinking about that. Now, second point is that masking does not spread downward. Once you get a half an ERB below the masker, there's no masking to speak of because what's happening is there two signals are exciting different parts of the cochlea and they'll both be perfectly obvious. So that's why the difference in the two files with the added sign, one of them dropped the, uh, the interfering signal by an octave and it popped right out. Which means if two signals, this is the first thing to remember about masking. If two signals have different spectra, they're not going to mask each other. They might a little bit if the level difference is 80 dB or 70 dB difference. 
Uh, but this doesn't mean that two signals with spectrum, a similar spectra will interact and some parts be masked because the second part of this question is when is this masking happening? If it's simultaneous where both signals are present at the same time, this is the strongest case. I'll give some numbers for this later. There is post-masking where the masker comes first, followed by the masked signal. This is a smaller effect. It varies enormously with frequency. And I also, and this is very important to remember, it also varies quite a bit with the way the listener is paying attention, which makes this a very tricky thing to deal with. So in general, while it exists, it's not big. And then there's pre-masking where, the where the mask comes after the signal. For all practical intents purposes, it doesn't exist. This is where pre-echo comes from in codex, for instance. The problem is, is that if this first signal comes along, starts to excite the, co the cochlea a little bit, you have a neurological signal. Now, the second one comes along that can be 50 or 60 dB higher, it's going to excite the same piece of the cochlea, yes, it's going to create a much bigger impression, but you've already changed the perception, so it's not masked. And this is classic problem, the nonlinearity of the air. The order that things get there is very important. So now we have the first two roles of masking, which is to say to interact on math masking, you must have similar spectra from the two signals. And there must be enough level difference that one of them is masked. And of course, the, the, the third of the first two rules of masking is that they have to be closely time aligned, which brings us to the first three rules of masking. But there's more. So now, if you're 30 dB down with no pre echo and simultaneous station, you're good. Yeah, probably. If you can look at the ERB, on a third, on a third by a third ERB scale, if you can see that one signal is more than 30 dB down everywhere in cross frequency, you're good. But you don't always need 30 dB. Now this brings us to the next demo we've got. Um, to explain TMN means tone masking noise, and NMT means noise masking tone. And again, you want to use headphones. You don't want to get into room issues because it can just confuse you greatly. Now, the first one with the tone masking the noise, the noise level is 15 dB down. You're going to hear that. The tone is going to have this peculiar, weird wobble to it. Um, tone masking noise is 30 dB. That's just all there is to it. The second one is noise masking tone, which is, by the way, the same signal that you heard the very first file that I mentioned. Um, and you're not even, there's not a chance you're going to hear the tone under the under the 15, under the noise is 15 dB loud, louder inside the same ERB. AJ, we have a question. <clears throat> Does time aligned mean phase aligned? Um, I'll get to that in a minute because the answer is sometimes. Perfect, thank you. <laughs> the pro what, it, what it amounts to is it below a kill, I'll add, say so now, the kilo, below a kilohertz, the ear actually will fire, have neuro, neuro firings in phase with the signal below a kilohertz. Above two kilohertz, it operates on the envelope of the signal. Between one and two kilohertz, some of one, some of the other. So your answer is at low frequencies, phase is important. At high frequencies, phase is not important, but the envelope is. Now, this doesn't affect the 30 dB so much. Simultaneous 30 dB does not really involve any questions of phase. It's just far enough down that you'll never detect it. But to give you an idea, this is the spectra. This is pretty clear, I think. The noise masking tone, you don't hear the tone. The tone masking noise, it's not masked at all. But there's some classical results. Tone masking noise is 30 dB. Noise masking tone is between five and a half to seven and a half dB, depending on whose authority, what test, and how you train the listeners. 
There is, however, a but here. And that is that if you have a signal, another signal to compare with, which I'll get to in a minute, that some very annoying things may happen. Now, noise masking noise, again, it's about five and a half dB. Now, what's happening when you have the noise masker, it means that the signal is varying randomly in that ERB. The result of the randomness means that you can't actually detect small changes because the there's already, if you will, noise present in what you're detecting. So the signal to noise ratio required to, to modify that require you know, and enough noise to or enough noise or tone to modify that perception has to be pretty close to the original signal. And then noise masking noise with the same signal source, which is to say just the level change gets down to around three and a half dB. Basically, it's the error signal for two signals with a two the same signal with the gain applied. Okay, now, so noise is simple, tones are simple, right? Well, okay, this is where it all goes to pot because almost all signals are somewhere in the middle. Human speech is usually around half tonal, half noise like, you know, you need a between the 15 and 20 dB signal to noise ratio for voice tone and about voice speech and about five, about five to seven for unvoiced speech. And the real definition of tone means that the signal envelope inside the ARB is constant. It doesn't actually mean it's a sine wave. It means that the envelope is constant. Now, that actually to some extent requires the, the signal to be a sine wave, at least at low frequencies, but that constant envelope is the key here. And the noise basically means that the envelope varies substantially within the ERB, or alternatively, that the leading edge of the phase and the waveform at low frequencies varies a lot in that ERB. So there really is a question of, is it very stationary within the ERB or does it wobble around? So it's not simple. Um, there is a lot of work done on this and it's very difficult to come up with something which is very good and predictive to whether it's gonna to be tone-like or noise-like or somewhere in the middle. Um, I think I'm responsible for at least four or five different models, um, all of which have their strong points and their weak points. But until you actually just go to a basic cochlear analysis and look what you get, you're not really going to come up with a good result. And that is possible, it is complicated. And yes, today we can do it, but it's nobody said simple. So there's the four rules of masking. You have to have similar spectra. You have to have enough level difference. Two signals have to be time aligned. The time domain structure has to be considered. And of course, approximations are required, which of course got us immediately to five rules. And you notice we haven't done stereo. Remember me talking about time delays and time regularity and envelope. Well, that all comes into play in stereo. As a couple of the folks who just showed up know way, way, way too well, stereo puts another clinker into this. So we've talked about monophonic signal. We'll talk about stereo now. I think probably most people have heard of the Suzanne Vega problem. Um, now the Suzanne Vega problem is interesting because the person singing in the track is almost 100% mono monophonic, but not quite. That means that the codex, if you use two monophonic codex, will have the same signal, the same common signal in both for the, what they're coding, but the decoding noise is going to be independent of the two channels. Now, obviously, if the noise and the signal are in phase in the two channels, this goes straight to the monophonic situation. But then there's the case when it doesn't. Suzanne Vega, 
is a good example. There are others. It's basically, the first problem with Suzanne Vega is it's a broadband signal and it takes a lot of bits. So there's a lot of noise added by the codec. The second problem is that the signal itself is almost monophonic, but when you put it through two independent codecs, the coding noise is independent in the two channels. Now this brings us to something which has been dubbed BMLD or binaural masking level depression. What this says basically is that under certain circumstances, stereo in stereo, the five and a half dB noise masking tone can drop all the way to 30 dB. But it only happens when one of the signals in the two ears is correlated and the other one isn't. And the same thing happens envelope above two kilohertz and modeling the part between one and two kilohertz, you have to go straight down to the hairy details of the cochlear analysis. Again, I'm not even gonna start talking about that. So what happens? As I said in the last slide, you have a signal in two ears. There's a couple issues. The difference is in the arrival time or the wave shape at low frequencies lead to imaging effects. We use it in stereo all the time. Okay, that's how, that's how our ears detect direction. But what happens is when you have two signals that are above the 30 dB masking level, but below the five and a half dB level, and you image the two signals differently, you get unmasking. Basically, this leads to the problem where you can actually have something that sounds perfectly good in a monophonic encoder, sounds terrible in two monophonic encoders, and then sounds perfectly good in a stereo encoder that knows about this masking level depression. This can also happen to high frequencies, but that's prim responding primarily to the onset of the envelope at high frequencies. But yes, you have to pay attention to it. But there are some other things you people that are asking about. If I have two instruments playing in unison and I pan them to different places, um, I can hear both of them. That's why. Because say, if you have two clarinets in different places, the two clarinets, even if they're playing the same note, the pitch spikes from the two clarinets are not going to coincide. So now you can identify two, your brain can identify two different sources, even if they're equal level, or even if one is six or eight dB lower than the other, and you could easily identify these because you hear the image of the two clarinets. Or in the case of Suzanne Vega, it sounds like somebody coughing their lungs out to the side of the signal at the same time that Suzanne Vega is singing in the middle. So this is what the binaural thing is. This is something you want to remember if you're trying to decide, will I be able to hear both of these instruments? If they're going to have, <coughs> my apologies, um, the, if you're going to have two things which have similar spectra, but have different, a little bit different times, structure or if the time structure isn't aligned, you present one of those to each ear, your brain will take it apart and you'll hear them both. So there you go. Now, what does this mean to us? Well, I have the demo here. Again, it's sort of hard. You know, maybe what I will do is after I start talking while we're in the breakout, if people want to go listen to these, they can. But if you listen to in phase dot wave and out phase dot wave, you notice they don't sound the same. Now I made these signals and I can tell you right now, the two signals have identical power spectra to double precision level. I mean, one part in 10 to the minus 22 or something. I think when, I, when it gets all done with all the processing, I think it's like, one part in 10 to the minus 22, or sorry, two to the minus 22 difference. They're the same, but they don't sound the same. They don't even sound slightly the same. This is what stereo listening can do to you. And I have the spectra of these now. Well, I can show you the spectra in a minute, but the point is that 
both signal both these signals the masker is a noise masker it's the identical it's the same literally the same pcm values in phase you have a mass a sine wave that's in phase in the two channels out phase the same sine wave is in the two channels but it is inverted in one channel again it's the same bits they're just added together one's added one's subtracted the power spectra are absolutely 100 percent identical first case you can't hear the sine wave and the second case well you have to listen to it because it's an, it's something that because it's generated artificially most people don't really have a word for but masked is not the word for it so those are actually if there's only two you're going to listen to do these are the ones to listen to so Here's the left and right spectra. This is for the signal in phase. This is for the signal out of phase. You notice as I switch back and forth, you see absolutely nothing changed but the label. This, the two signals are absolutely freaking identical. And all these really hard to see plots will eventually wind up in the meeting recap page along with the PowerPoint deck. And then you'll be able to read them. I apologize for the graphics, but they're the graphics I've got. So the effects of BMLD, it can take a signal that's indetectable at 6 dB signal to noise ratio and make it detectable down to 30 dB when, it's, when the two signals are not identical in the two ears. This is a big problem in dry rooms and headphones. It's a lot easier to hear in headphones, but it will occasionally bite you in regular rooms as well. So the finally the fine rules of masking. First, you have to have some more spectrum. There has to be a level difference. They have to be closely time aligned. The structure of the signal inside the ERB matters a great deal. And you have to do some approximations um, or you have to do unbelievably painful amounts of analysis. You have to pay attention to both the masker and mass signal phase when you're doing a stereo presentation. Having one either be out of phase interorally or just in a different phase, it doesn't have to be all the way out of phase, can make huge differences sometimes. If it's tone masking something, that's not going to change. If it's not tone masking something, if it's noise-like or partly noise-like, then the masking level is going to change dramatically. Um, if you have any effect that can be detected by, by narrow masking level depression. And finally, the sixth row of masking. If it's audible in any ERB, it's not masked. And this is important to remember, if you can lock into it in some ERB and it's not masked. Now you're back to that 30 dB issue again, 30 dB level again, because now your ear and your brain have evolved to very effectively start sorting out the time domain responses from other frequencies to extract parts of the signal that could be partially masked signals from this signal that you've focused now on in some particular frequency band. This is one of the reasons that we can understand conversation in a loud room. It's also the reason that sometimes you'll think somebody says something off in some funny direction and it just isn't a case because you brain locked on to some little piece of noise and then extracted something that was kind of sort of speech-like from the noise around you and for a second you heard it, but then of course the coherence of all this falls apart and it's gone. So takeaway ideas, similar spectrum may mask, similar time domain behavior may be masked. Different time structures will prevent masking. I say may, it really is will prevent masking. Even the hint for one or two ERBs in a time structure can cause a great deal of unmasking and that's way beyond what I want to talk about. Yes, whoever said different signals, different vibratos, absolutely. Yep, that's, that will unmask them. 
the pitch periods won't line up, the vibrato won't line up. And that's a very good point, uh, Jamie. Thanks, Jamie. Um, that kind of thing is why you will hear two people singing. And so we are to that stage where people now want to ask questions and I'm pretty sure somebody will want to. Now in this, in this case, since you're, uh, since we're all here, I think people that want to ask questions could probably pop up because they're not going to be interrupting you. But I've got a couple of questions. One is, what is the practical use of this information? Is this primarily in perceptual coding and codex, or is it in like in our mix? I've, I've heard, and maybe you can speak to this, uh, a, a phrase that low frequencies mask high frequencies for when we're dealing with things. Does this have anything to do with that? Is that not even a thing? Or what's what's the what's the the nail that this hammer hits? Just to let us Well know. it while it's useful in coding, I'm not terribly interested in coding anymore. Um, my point is is that people have been asking actually pretty much all over all the audio groups and network, why is this why does this instrument disappear? Why did this instrument not disappear and things like that? So it has a lot of practical application in mixing, specifically in knowing that you want to maybe separate the time structure, different things out, and put them differently into the two ears. Okay, um, so this is basically um, a, a problem that if you don't know this is why the problem happens, you don't really know what the solution can be. But if you have an idea, uh, this thing happens, and I know that this might be why it lets me change things. Yeah, I mean, it, you know, basically, I guess the way to put it is, a simple way to put it is two things that sound the same can actually be um, separated in space or in frequency um, if you know you need to do that. Okay, Whereas, I've got, there's some questions coming in so we can actually shift over here. Derek says, what happens when you're at crossover between two drivers or listening to an array of drivers playing the same spectrum at the same time? What matters is whatever gets to your ear. I can't address that directly. I will say that if you have a crossover that doesn't have inversions, um, you will get more, you will get substantially more uh, ability to separate out instruments if the two cross, well, when, put it first off, analog crossovers are never quite identical. And that difference in phase around the crossover point always introduces some ambiguity that can mess things up. It can work either way, but usually it works in, in the direction of masking more, but that's not always true. But the second thing is, is that really what matters is what gets to your ear, which is why I say, when you listen to this stuff, listen to it in headphones. Um, now, uh, Here's a couple more. Uh, Jamie says singers actually alter their spectra to become unmasked. Yes. Uh, in reference to the backing instruments. And Jerry is asking more comments on the effects of aging on the ability to separate one voice in a crowded room. The thing that messes you up when you get old, speaking from experience, is when your two ears don't work the same anymore. Well, there are other things, but they would involve much more serious pathology and let's, let's hope we don't have to go there. Greg is asking, would amplitude modulation of one of the mask signals help unmask it? And if so, does the frequency of the amplitude modulation have to be a high enough frequency to actually have this work? Um, it certainly can. There are frequencies you want to avoid you don't want to try this at low frequencies at all, but the high frequencies, if you can come up with something which is semi pitch synchronous, you don't want to add you don't want to add harmonic components, or all sorts of bad stuff happens, and that will make more masking always. But uh, if you can come up with something which is quasi signal synchronous, and you can move two things apart in time a little bit. And in the different ears, it's important. It has to be at least partly into the different ears. Yes, that will help. Okay. 
And so Mike, is that good? Mike Metesky asked, and there's Greg. Greg. Oh, hey, about. just to clarify. So JJ, what you're talking about is not just simple fader movements. Like if I'm a mix engineer and I'm having, no. a, and I'm, you know, I'm mixing in mono and I have a problem with max masking, just a, a subtle fader movement is not going to be able to help me. The subtle fader movement in mono will do nothing for you. A subtle twiddle in the pan pot might. Okay. But that's, cool. yeah. Mike was and, asking, oh, go ahead. Oh, Mike, Mike was asking um, about he's recording his, a, I'll, I'll read it. Uh, he's I, recording, oh, yeah, just scrolled off the top, yes. That's all right. He's recording a premiere of a clarinet work for two clarinets. It will be recorded by two musicians and also by <clears throat> one musician, clearly on two separate tracks. Does this in any way have practical application to such recording? Well, you want to locate them in two different places in this in the stereo field, but I'm pretty sure Mike knew that. <laughs> but this is why you, what's going to happen is the pit. You know, clarinets are very pitchy instruments. If you look at the waveform, they're a spike followed by a ring. And if you have those two, and when you have those two sets of spikes, and they're handled coming in at different different times to the two ears, that will absolutely that will absolutely excite the localization. That will work at both low and high frequencies. And it will mean that you get a solid stereo separation and you'll hear both of them. Cool. I mean, you would almost have to play the instruments so that the two reeds were opening and closing at the same time to avoid that. Okay. Is uh, our audio codex and their handling of masking optimized mostly for headphones, or is there also speaker testing? There is no general answer to that. Sorry. Uh, sorry, Alex, but there is no general answer to that because some of them were optimized for one, some of them are optimized for the other, some are optimized for both. And to address the thing is it just actually requires more bit rate and more consideration to handle both speakers and headphones. You can ignore some things in headphones, you can ignore other things in speakers. And you can't ignore either of those if you have to use both. Okay, Stephen Clark Wilson says, I'll admit I watch American Idol sometimes, and sometimes the contestant's audio gets lost behind the backup singers. I figured it was mixed poorly, but now I'm thinking that perhaps the audio engineer's dials look great, but if the contestant doesn't lead the background singers a bit in time, maybe the backup singers mask the contestant. I imagine professional singers know how to lead the background singers. That's a more complicated question because we're talking about two things. One, we're talking about wave leading in terms of um, tight of vice precise waveform analysis. The other one we're talking about is singing char characteristic whereby you push the beginning of the measure a little bit to stand out from everybody else. So there's two, there's an artistic part to that and there is a, an auditory part to that. And the only way I could answer the question would be to take the audio and analyze it and such as life. So it's not necessarily a musical talent thing that can be you know, this will put you out on top if you're a little bit ahead of the beat, which sounds like it might not even, it might not be the intention of what the music could be if you're ahead of the beat, myself thinking. It, you know. It's, well, if you want to sound sort of aggressive, you try to lead a little bit. If you want to sound relaxed, you, you know, that's an artistic question, not a, uh, not a hearing question. Exactly. And Mike Metesky replies here, thanks for addressing the question. I feared getting into localization, miking, et cetera, was silly behind our time constraint. However, clear perception of both instruments without issue should be achievable. Still, momentary masking is something I'll be eyeballing. And Jamie says again, apparently, if you sing a steady tone in reverb, no vibrato, after a while, the reverb becomes masked and you can't hear it. That's generally true because it's matching the spectrum of the signal. Right, interesting. Cool. Now, the well, thing is, as soon as you stop, then you'll hear the reverb, but that's because now the level's changing. Right. Okay. This is working reasonably well, I hope, uh, for everyone. And uh, 
changes good for making stuff stand out says james yes okay at some point when we're past questions i'm going to throw this back to greg as desired and uh do you have any well jay jj do you have any other things that uh that you'd like to communicate this evening uh in general the about the either the topic or something different uh greg says there's another come up it seems like the suzanne vega effect is bad and something we want to avoid question well mark. no it's as you want to avoid, standby, you want as to Nick, avoid it in a coding you want to avoid it in a kodak okay but you as mixed don't. mastering engineers what should we try to avoid not to have these effects happen they won't happen as a mixed mastering engineer they'll happen as a codec designer is this correct yes it's a codec designer and my answer to that is to use a codec that doesn't do it <laughs> they it exist. was just it was just sort of yes. a worst case uh, it, yeah, if if you have to use MP3 in dual mono mode, you have there's a lot of things you don't want to do. Please, nobody do that. In fact, nobody use MP3 anymore. Okay. Yes, please. There's there's no no reason for it. That that brings <laughs> up a, a, a pet peeve that I had in the aughts is when people were saying, should you master specifically for MP3 and take off the top 5K so it won't hit it? And that made no. me so angry because no, 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 you make it as good as it can be. You don't wound something for a temporal problem. Anyway, sorry. Yeah, oh, totally. Yeah. I, I masked you for a while. Good. No, I think, we, I think we agree entirely on this one. No, yeah, no, it's, no, it's, no, no, no. Make it no. the best it can be, no matter what the machinery of the day is. Make it, make it sound right in PCM. Yeah, and that's another thing people ask me. Uh, I'm a mastering engineer and people ask me, so. Uh, did I give you the appropriate pre-master and I communicate to them what I think that is. And my answer is, if you like what came back, you gave me exactly the right thing. So Angel has a question about, but I think he's got to type a little bit. Okay, I will wait. Okay. That's okay. Typing into some of these things is quite uh, difficult. What do you think about DSD? Is DSD is nothing but noise shape PCM so what so it's it, a thing it, it, it's a vehicle right I mean all of these it's, things it's a delivery vehicle. vehicle it's a delivery vehicle DSD is literally noise shape high sampling rate low bit count PCM and okay it's that um it has different effects you have different filter constraints and so on um, this is totally outside of this question and related to that series of talks I want to do on, I was talking to the committee a while ago on um, what does it mean to have a signal that has 20 kilohertz bandwidth and so on and so forth. This is a difficult question to answer in five minutes because we have to go back and define about 40 terms. Yeah, it's, but, it's interesting the whole, you know, Audio, the whole tuning the air thing, the audiophile thing of when you're hearing something in person and then you're hearing something reproduced, or if you're hearing something that was created in the studio and then reproduced, it's a it's it, yeah. it's interesting days, you know, yeah. you get past that. So Alex asked, speaking of codecs, you mentioned being in some being room and some being headphone optimized. Is this a substantial difference or just small technical details? Um, yes, I know that's sort of vague. Um, the way you have to handle stereo unmasking and cancellation of out of phase signals is substantially different, but it's all at the encoder. Hmm. Hmm. Is it that sort of like jitter, right? Jitter is primarily as it, as it moves. The decoder can only do what it thinks is right. Yes. But the all encoder the, is what all makes the perceptual the codecs. It's the encoder. Does the encoder account account for potential signal cancellation and speakers? Does it account for potential uh, BMLD in headphones? And that's not all. There's about three or four other things you have to account for, but. It's a question of what does the encoder do? 
And yes, the encoder does different things. It has to. Huh. Okay. And, so, and the so other thing really... I will say, the other thing I will say is that if you're worried about imaging artifacts, which is a different problem question than masking, um, you'll have if you uh, if you're worried about imaging artifacts, you have to listen both in headphones and in speakers because you will get different imaging artifacts. Hmm. Brian Willoughby uh, nicely says, search the AES library of papers for one bit del sigma delta if you want to learn about DSD. So and all the way back to the paper by Joe Candon and Jim Candy that appeared in BSTJ, it lays the math out really nicely. Excellent. Bob Smith asks if you could discuss how some sounds are unmasked at lower fawn levels while masked at higher fawn levels. Then let's well, define a fawn, shall we? Well, some Fletcher Munson aspect. A fawn is a, a defined measure of loudness. So higher fawn levels means louder, not more energetic, but louder. Okay, but what's happening as you get above about 70 dB, you start to overload the basal membrane. When you start to overload the basal membrane, the filters get wider. As the filters get wider, of course, you have more energy in one ERB effectively, and so you have more masking. So the higher, the, when you make the level higher, the masking spreads primarily in an upward direction. If you go to 110 dB, which you shouldn't, but happens, you'll find out that there's as much masking an entire octave above as there is at the frequency of the actual energy. Hmm. And the reason for that is you just basically blown out the ability of the basilar membrane to control, to operate as a frequency analyzer. So on the lower left-hand corner of the fletcher munz curves, which uh, have our low frequency, low levels uh, that we don't hear well because if we could, our heart rate and blood flow would drive us insane. Is that a, uh, a function of masking or, or just physiology? That is a function of the resonance of the eardrum. Eardrum, the eardrum, or the eardrum itself. The eardrum itself rolls off about 60 dB per octave below 700 hertz. Okay, cool. Jamie says, interestingly, the speech transmission index, STI, takes account of the self-masking for high levels. In voice alarm systems now, louder is not better. Absolutely. If you've ever been to a rock concert, you put on your ear protectors, you know, you can understand the words better. Same thing. Don't overload. You know, don't destroy your inner hair cells. Really, please. It's a very temporary thing. Okay, but it's not actually. Oh, all right. It's so, not. Uh, <laughs> any other any other uh, questions coming out of the field? Um, and and again, yeah. So this sounds good. Um, Greg, would you like, we'd spend an hour, even though it's like 45 minutes here, but Greg, why don't I pass you back the baton? And uh, I may have a client that's waiting for me in a little while, so I might not be here much longer, but thank you, thank you, JJ. Thank you, Greg. And Making you. money is always good. It's, it's, it's a joy, and maybe I'll talk about it. <laughs> so I'll, I'll, I'll check out. Thanks, Greg. Cool. Thank you so much, um, JJ, for the really uh, thought-provoking and informative presentation tonight. And uh, also thank Steve for helping out with moderation. Really appreciate your, your help there. And um, I do want to just make sure that there aren't any other questions before we conclude. Um, I did want to follow up. Uh, Jamie, I think it's Jamie, yes, had another comment. There were some measurements done in the UK, it says UK BW, widening due to loudness lasts longer than the threshold shift. Yeah, Can well, the point that, is, is it, well, it's, if you fatigue the outer hair cells, you're gonna, you, things get messed up. If you start tearing them, it gets even worse. 
they can recover a little bit sometimes, but don't do that. And as far as Brian's question, um, let me run over next door and get my get the book, and then I'll tell you the title of the book. How's that? <laughs> I think I have it next door. Let me go look. Sounds okay? good. Or maybe someone else that's here knows. It's the yeah, Brian Moore. It's the Brian. There's two. There are two books that are very useful. Brian C.J. is more in the psychology of hearing, something like that, and Bill Yost's Y.O.S.T. on the physiology of hearing. Those are really useful. And now we have uh, we have another question. Actually, I can still. Steve, why don't you take, take it, it away? I'm gonna. I will. Okay, Greg. Thank you, and we'll we'll just continue to bounce in and out. Uh, if a stereo signal is combined into mono in a stereo amp and played through one speaker and very noticeable loss of musical content is perceived, is this likely masking or some aspect of phase manipulation in the mix? And I would think it would be out of phase, actually. It would be, it would be both. Hmm. Because you've destroyed, if you, if you, if you mono the signal, you sum the two signals, you destroyed any different stimuli to the two ears, and that will affect masking. But you can also get spectral cancellation if you have any sort of time delay. So the answer to that question is yes. Okay. I'm not as big a fan of Zwicker and Fassel, but it's not a bad book. So, and that's Jamie at 3 a.m. plus, which we Three. appreciate. Herself. I am amazed that she's still awake. That's a, a highly skilled human. Uh, well, a highly informed human too. That's even better, yeah. Uh, so is it, I, I, Greg, come on back. Let's let's ratchet back and forth until we get to a to a steady sure. state. Yeah, I'd like to echo that. Thank you, Jamie, for not only being here but for the really thought provoking and helpful comments that you've made throughout the meeting. Um, if there aren't any other comments, we'll move on to the brief breakout sessions. <laughs>